Greetings. Welcome to Journey Through the Bible. You may have noticed I got a new mask. Isn't this great? Our Lady of Guadalupe. I don't know if you can see that or not. Let me grab it upside down. There we go. Anyway, this is my new mask and uh, the office is closed. There's nobody around. So I feel comfortable doing the session without this. My name is Father Paul Joseph. Again, welcome to Journey Through the Bible as we continue our journey through the Gospel of John. Let's take a moment and bow our heads in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, once again, we come before you as your children, recognizing the inspiration of our sacred scriptures that guide us in our journey of faith and help bring us closer to you, our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to remember that your word is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Your word is here for us to guide us and bless us. Loving God, I call upon your blessings on all of us here today, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, last week, we began the Gospel of John, and right about the 45 or 46 minute mark, the computer cut off. Now, it's 100% charged. There's no other video stored on here. I'm not exactly sure what's going on. So what I'll do is I'll give you updates each time, a few minutes, when we know what time we are, so we'll hopefully we go the full hour. If we don't make it to the full hour, don't think that I gave up and ran off on a bike ride or something like that. I've already done my bike ride for today. So anyway, we are in the Gospel of John, beginning with chapter five. Now, we noticed in the first four chapters how we had so much that was different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The prologue, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Again, it's a very deep theology. It's a wonderful, beautiful Gospel. But like I said, it is a little bit different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're referred to as the Synoptic Gospels. John is a little different. Now, as we recall, there are seven signs or seven miracles that, Saint John, that Jesus performed in St. John's Gospel. We're going to begin today with the Gospel of John, chapter 5, and this is the third sign, the third miracle of our Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 5, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there was in Jerusalem at the Sheep Gate a pool called in Hebrew Bethesda with five porticos. Porticos were like little porches, kind of like you would think little uh, umbrellas or uh, shaded areas. And that's where the people would sit at the pool. In these lay a large number of ill, blind, lame, and crippled. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, he knew he had been ill for a long time, and he said to him, do you want to be well? The sick man answered, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. Well, I'm on the way. Someone else gets down there before me. And Jesus said to him, rise, take up your mat and walk. Immediately, the man became well, took up his mat and walked. This was a belief of the people that at this pool, if you had any sort of illness or if you had any sort of deformity with your legs, your joints, you could be healed by the water, the running water, the stirred up water. But again, this man was crippled. He couldn't get into the water. But Jesus, once again, like he does in all of his miracles, responds to the people of faith. So Jesus says in verse eight, rise, take up your mat and walk. Immediately the man became well took up his mat and walked. Now that day was a Sabbath, as we know the day of prayer for our Jewish brothers and sisters. So the Jews said to the man who was cured, it is a Sabbath and it is not lawful for you to carry your mat. Once again, it seems a little extreme to us, but that was part of the Hebrew law. He answered them, the man who made me well told me, take up your mat and walk. They asked him, who was the man who told you, take up your mat and walk? The man who was healed did not know who he was, for Jesus had slipped away since there was a crowd there. After this, Jesus found him in the temple area and said to them, look, you are well, do not sin anymore, so that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went and told the Jews that Jesus was the one who had made him well. Therefore, the Jews began to persecute Jesus because he did this on the Sabbath day. We've talked about this before, but the idea of doing any sort of work on the Sabbath was strictly prohibited. Now it says the Jews began to persecute Jesus. We have to understand that was certain leaders of the Jewish people, primarily the Pharisees and the Sadducees. 
They were the ones who were persecuting Jesus. This does not relate to all the Jewish people of Jerusalem or of any other period. So in the verse 16, therefore the Jews began to persecute Jesus because he did this on a Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is at work until now, so I am at work. For this reason, the Jews tried all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but he also called God his own father, making himself equal to God. Remember, this is why the leaders of the Jewish people wanted to crucify Jesus. It was out of envy, but their excuse was blasphemy. He is making himself equal to God by saying that he is the son of God. Now, verse 19, this goes all the way up to verse 30. And it's kind of a long uh, story here, but it's very interesting the way Jesus approaches them with their, his answer. And this is verse 19. Jesus answered and said to them, Amen, I say to you, a son cannot do anything on his own, but only what he sees his father doing. What he does, his son will do also. For the father loves his son and shows him everything that he himself does and he will show him greater works than these so that you may be amazed. For just as the father raises the dead and gives life, so also does the son give life to whomever he wishes. Nor does the father judge anyone, but he has given all judgment to his son so that all may honor the son just as they honor the father. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Amen, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in the one who sent me has eternal life and will not come to condemnation, but has passed from death to life. It's very interesting. This is a long speech, a long narrative of Jesus. You don't see anything like this in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But look at the richness of it. Look at the depth of it. And continuing with verse 25, amen, I say to you, the hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. Earlier he was using the reference to Son of Man. Here he actually uses Son of God. For just as the Father has life in himself, so also he gave to his Son the possessions of life in himself. And he gave him power to exercise judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this because the hour is coming which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come out. Those who have done good deeds to the resurrection of life, but to those who have done wicked deeds to the resurrection of condemnation. Once again, Jesus is letting the people know, just as in Matthew's gospel, he separates the sheep from the goats. In John's gospel, he talks about those who have done good deeds will come to the resurrection of life, but those who have done wicked deeds deeds to the resurrection of condemnation. In verse 30, I cannot do anything on my own. I judge as I hear, and my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. Once again, Jesus came to do the will of the Father. That is his whole purpose. And in John's gospel, we hear that, that Jesus came to glorify the Father and bring the message of salvation. In verse 31, Jesus continues this long narrative. If I testify on my own behalf, my testimony cannot be verified. But there is another who testifies on my behalf, and now I know that the testimony he gives on my behalf is true. You sent emissaries to John, and he testified to the truth. This is John the Baptist, not John the Evangelist who wrote this. You sent emissaries to John, and he testified to the truth. I do not accept testimony from a human being, but I say this so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and for a while you are content to rejoice in his light. Just as John the Baptist was baptized in the Jordan River, Jesus is saying how the people were content to rejoice in his light. In verse 36, but I have testimony greater than John's. The works that the Father gave me to accomplish, these works that I perform, testify on my behalf that the Father has sent me. The works that Jesus performed that he's referring to, these were his miracles, the seven signs of John's gospel. As I said before, these were not parlor tricks done to entertain people. 
He's showing his power as the son of God, bringing the message of love by responding to the faith of the people. In verse 37, or excuse me, verse 36, but I have testimony greater than John's. The work that the Father gave me to accomplish, these works that I perform, testify on my behalf that the Father has sent me. Moreover, the Father who sent me has testified on my behalf. You have heard his, you have heard his voice, nor seen his form. You have never heard his voice, nor seen his form. And you do not have his word remaining in you, because you do not believe in the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think you have eternal life be through them. Even they testify on my behalf, but you do not want to come to me to have life. Once again, they were not ready to accept Jesus as the Savior, as the Messiah. They were waiting for a military leader, a government leader, or at least a business leader. He wasn't any of those, but the scriptures, the Old Testament, refer to Jesus. Remember at the end of Luke's gospel, when he encounters the two disciples on the, words to, on the way to Emmaus and the words of Jesus explained everything about him in the scriptures, once again, Jesus says, the scriptures testify on my behalf. In verse 41, I do, not accept hum, I do not accept human praise. Moreover, I know that you do not have the love of God in you. I came in the name of my father, but you do not accept me. Yet if another comes in his own name, you'll accept him. How can you believe when you accept praise from one another? And do not seek the praise that comes from the only God. Do not think I will accuse you before the Father. The one who will accuse you is Moses, in whom you have placed your hope. For you, have, if you had believed Moses, you would have believed me, because he wrote about me. But if you do not believe this, these writings... How will you believe my words? This is a long narrative. Jesus never does this in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But John has this long narrative. Jesus has long talked to the leaders of the Jews, but he is explaining his position as the Son of God, the Son of Man, the one who is bringing salvation into the world. Chapter 6 is often referred to as the Bread of Life Discourse. Jesus is the Bread of Life. He must eat his flesh and drink his blood in order to have eternal life. Now, chapter 6 begins with Jesus going to Jerusalem for the second time. Remember, three years in a row in John's Gospel, Jesus goes to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. This is the second trip to Jerusalem, the second year to celebrate the Passover during his ministry, and he will perform his fourth sign. So we're in chapter 6, verse 1. After this, Jesus went across the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs he was performing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. The Jewish feast of Passover was near. When Jesus raised his eyes and saw that a large crowd was coming to him, he said to Philip, where can we buy enough food for them to eat? He said this to test him, because he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, 200 days wages worth of food would not be enough for each of them to have a little bit. One of his disciples, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. Well, what good are these for so many? Jesus said, have the people recline. Now there was a great deal of grass in that place. So the men reclined, about 5,000 in number. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed them to those who were reclining, and also as much of the fish as they wanted. When they had had their fill, he said to his disciples, gather the fragments left over so that nothing will be wasted. So they collected them and filled 12 wicker baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves that had been more than they could eat. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is truly the prophet, the one who is to come into the world. Since Jesus knew that they were going to come and carry him off to make him a king, he withdrew again to the mountain alone. It's really interesting. The leaders are trying to kill him. The people are trying to carry him off and make him king. 
Jesus doesn't want either one of those. Obviously, it's not his time for crucifixion, and his kingdom is not of this world, it is of the heavenly kingdom. So again, Jesus is caught in a bit of a uh, quagmire here, but he knows that what he has done, he's preparing the people for the Eucharist. This was not Holy Communion, this was not his body and blood. He was addressing their physical needs. At the Last Supper, he gives us Holy Communion for our spiritual needs. Now in verse 16, we have the fifth sign that Jesus is going to perform, and this is the walking on the water. So this is chapter six, verse 16. When it was evening, his disciples went down to the sea, embarked in a boat, and went across the sea to Capernaum. Remember, Capernaum was the town on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus spent most of his time in his ministry. It had already grown dark, and Jesus had not come to them. The sea was stirred up because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they began to be afraid. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. How many times have we heard that? Do not be afraid. They wanted to take him into the boat, but the boat immediately arrived at the shore to which they were heading. Now, once again, we don't have the story of Peter walking on the water. It is important, but the important thing is that Jesus walked on the water. Once again, it shows his power as the Son of God. Now, in verse 22, we begin the Bread of Life discourse. And again, this is in one more long narrative that continues in John's gospel, but it's a beautiful narrative. And that's why we did the first three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, so we can look at the parables, look at the miracles, and then go into John's gospel, we have some of these long narratives. So in verse 22, we begin with the Bread of Life discourse. The next day, the crowd that had remained across the sea saw that there had been only one boat there, and that Jesus had not gone along with his disciples in the boat, but only the disciples had left. Other boats came from Tiberias, another town on the shore of Sea of Galilee, near the place where they had eaten the bread when the Lord gave thanks. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into boats and came to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him across the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered them and said, Amen, I say to you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, the Father, God, has sent his, set his seal. Once again, Jesus is preparing them for Holy Communion. In verse 28, so they said to him, what can we do to accomplish the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in the one he sent. Once again, another powerful statement in John's gospel. People said, what can we do to accomplish the works of God? This is the work of God that you believe in the one he sent. So they said to him, what sign can you do that we may see and believe in you? What can you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. If you recall, when the Hebrew people were leaving slavery in Egypt, they spent 40 years in the desert, they were hungry, and God gave them manna, the bread from heaven. This was physical bread to address their physical needs. Jesus is preparing them for the bread of life. So in verse 32, so Jesus said to them, And then I say to you, it was not Moses who gave the bread from heaven. My Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, Whoever believes in me will never thirst. Once again, one of these powerful statements in John's gospel. This is verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. But I told you that also, though you have seen me, you do not believe. 
everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and I will not reject anyone who comes to me. This is another powerful statement in John's Gospel. I will not reject anyone who comes to me. I know I've told this story before, but I remember as a volunteer at Juvenile Hall, the kid had come in there, probably his fourth or fifth time being arrested. He was getting to have a fitness hearing to see if they would try him as an adult. I remember talking to him and he said, don't waste your time with me. There's another kid in here that's much younger. It's his first time in here. He has hope, I don't. And I felt so bad about that for this young man. 17 years old, they're gonna try him as an adult. And I remember thinking of the scripture passage Jesus says, I will not reject anyone who comes to me. Even somebody who's been arrested four or five times, somebody who's preparing for a fitness hearing to see if they're gonna be tried as an adult. So in verse 37, I'm gonna start that again. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and I will not reject anyone who comes to me, because I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. Notice what Jesus is saying here. It's not his program. It's not his agenda. He has come to do the will of the Father. In verse 39, And this is the will of the one who sent me, that I should not lose anything of what he gave me, but that I should raise it on the last day. The message of resurrection is for everyone. The message of salvation is for everyone. Jesus will not reject anyone who comes to him. In verse 40, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life, and I shall raise him on the last day. Do you know that? That is the will of God, that each one of us has eternal life, that we will all be raised on the last day. It's a powerful statement when you think about it, and that's exactly what Jesus' point was. Now, In verse 41, the Jews murmured about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? We do not know his father and mother. And how can he say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered and said to them, Stop murmuring among yourselves, for no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him on the last day. For it is written in the prophets, They shall be called by God. They shall be taught by God. Everyone who listens to my Father and learns from him comes to me. Not that anyone who has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Amen, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the desert, but they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so one may eat it and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. See what Jesus is doing here. It's a long narrative, but it's the idea of preparing the people for their first Holy Communion at the Last Supper. Well, in verse 52, the Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them, just as the living Father sent me, and I have life because of the Father. So also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate and still died, whoever eats this bread will live forever. He says, he said, while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Once again, Jesus continues this narrative of preparing the people for the Holy Communion. But as you notice, this is a little difficult to take. My flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, this is going to be problematic for some people. Let's continue with what Jesus says in verse 60. Then many of the disciples were listening, saying, this, this said, this saying is hard. Who could accept it? Since Jesus knew that his disciples were murmuring about this, he said to them, does this shock you? What if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit 
that gives life, while the flesh is of no avail. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. Jesus knew from the beginning the ones who had not believed and the one who would betray him. And he said, for this reason, I've told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by my Father. Once again, Jesus came from the Father to bring the message of salvation, not to reject anyone, because that is what's granted to him by the Father. Verse 66, as a result of this, many of his disciples returned to their former way of life and no longer accompanied him. But Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to leave? But Simon Peter answered him, Master, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and are convinced that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus answered them, Did I not choose the twelve? Yet is not one of you a devil? He was referring to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. It was he who would betray him, one of the twelve. Once again, we look at this idea of Judas. We don't know a whole lot about him, but the idea that he betrayed our Lord Jesus Christ. But yet, the others stayed loyal to Jesus. Master, to whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life. Now, in chapter 7, there's another Jewish feast, the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles. And once again, we look at the idea of the feast. There were many of them in the Jewish tradition. It was a one of celebrating the way the people gathered together. And we are at the beginning of chapter 7, and I should have said this at the beginning. We are now on our outline on the middle of page 50. Sorry I didn't mention that at the beginning. I have my Bible here and my outline, and I'm juggling through things a little bit. But one of the things I pointed out on the uh, uh, beginning of chapter 7 on my outline on page 50 Jesus secretly goes to Jerusalem for the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles, also known as the Feast of Tents or Booths or of Sukkot. It was a joyful harvest festival where the people thanked God for protecting them during their wandering in the desert and for giving them a good harvest. And again, this is on the outline of page 50, the beginning of chapter 7. So now let us go back to the text of the Gospel of John, chapter 7. Verse 1. After this, Jesus moved about within Galilee, but he did not wish to travel in Judea in the south because the Jews were trying to kill him. But the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles was near. So his brothers, most likely his cousins, said to him, Leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples may also see the works you are doing. No one works in secret if he wants to be known publicly. If you do these things, Manifest yourself to the world, for his brothers did not believe in him. So Jesus said to them, My time is not yet here, but the time is always right for you. Jesus was talking about his timing because he knew when he would be crucified, when he would rise from the dead. He says, My time is not yet here, but the time is always right for you. And that's a message for us. We don't want to delay or procrastinate. Time is now. In verse 7, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify to that, it, to that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I will not be going up to the feast because my time has not yet been fulfilled. After he said this, he stayed in Galilee. Again, Galilee is in the north. In verse 10, when his brothers, cousins, had gone up to the feast, he himself also went up, not openly, or as it were, in secret. The Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, where is he? And there was considerable murmuring among them in the crowds. And Jesus said, he is a good man. While others said, no, on the contrary, he misleads the crowd. Still, no one spoke openly about him because they were afraid of the Jews. And once again, this is the fear of the leaders of the Jewish people. In verse 14, we have this first dialogue of Jesus, and it's very interesting, the conversation that goes on. Once again, it's quite lengthy, but there's also a great richness and a great depth to it. So this is chapter 7, verse 14. When the feast was already half over, Jesus 
went up into the temple area and began to teach. The Jews were amazed and said, how does he know scripture without having studied? Well, they didn't know that he was the son of God. They weren't ready to receive this. Of course, Jesus knows scripture. Everything in the Old Testament is in preparation for him. So verse 15, the Jews, the Jews were amazed and said, how does he know scripture without having studied? Jesus answered them and said, my teaching is not my own, but is from the one who sent me. Whoever chooses to do his will shall know whether my teaching is from God or whether I speak on my own. Whoever speaks on his own seeks his own glory, but whoever seeks the glory of the one who sent him is truthful, and there is no wrong in him. Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why are you trying to kill me? The crowd answered, you are possessed. Who is trying to kill you? Jesus answered and said to them, I perform one work, all of you were amazed because of it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it came from Moses, but rather from the patriarchs. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man can receive circumcision on a Sabbath, so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a whole person well on a Sabbath? Stop judging by appearances, but judge justly. Once again, the people are looking at the outward appearances, Remember Jesus said, the outside of the cup looks clean and nice, but the inside is filthy. The people were only concentrating on the appearances. So in verse 25, so some of the inhabitants of Jerusalem said, is he not the one they are trying to kill? And look, he is speaking openly and they say nothing to him. Could the authorities have realized that he is the Messiah? But we know where he is from. When the Messiah comes, no one will know where he is from. So Jesus cried out in the temple area, and was teaching and said out loud, you know me and also know where I am from. Yet I did not come on my own, but the one who sent me, whom you do not know is true. I know him because I am from him and he sent me. Obviously referring to God the Father. In verse 30, so they tried to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. But many of the crowd began to believe in him and said, when the Messiah comes, will he perform more signs than this man has done? Now they're beginning to question, is this really the Messiah? Now these are not his disciples. They know he's the Messiah. This is the crowd. They've been following. They've seen some of the signs. They've seen some of the miracles. They're asking this question, why is it that they want to kill him? And then they're saying, when the Messiah comes, well, he performed more signs than this man has done, which is basically their way of saying, I wonder if this is the Messiah. In verse 32, the Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring about him to this effect, and the chief priests and the Pharisees sent guards to arrest him. So Jesus said, I will only be with you a little while, a little while longer, and then I will go to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. So the Jews said to one another, where is he going that we will not find him? Surely he is not going to the dispersion among the Greeks to teach the Greeks, is he? The dispersion is the outlying area, sometimes referred to as the Decapolis, the 10 cities. The Greeks were not Jewish people. They were Gentiles. They did not believe in the Jewish law or the prophets. And so they're asking a question, is he going to go out among the Greeks to teach the Greeks as well? In verse 36, what is the meaning of his saying, you will look for me and not find me, and where I'm going you cannot come? They had no idea that he was talking about the heavenly kingdom. Yet, that's what Jesus is preparing for. In verse 37, on the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood up and exclaimed, let anyone who thirsts come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture says, Rivers of living water will flow from within him. Jesus is the bread of life, and he is also the living water. He said this in reference to the Spirit, that those who came to believe in him were to receive. This was, of course, there was, of course, no Spirit yet, because Jesus had not been glorified. Well, actually, there was a Holy Spirit, but not here on earth. 
Once Jesus is glorified in the resurrection, he will tell his apostles, wait here, the advocate, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit will come. So in verse 40, some of the crowd who heard these words said, this is truly the prophet. Others said, this is the Messiah. But others said, the Messiah will not come from Galilee, will he? Does not scripture say that the Messiah will be of David's family and come from Bethlehem, the village where David lived? I know we talked about this in Matthew and Luke's gospel. Mary and Joseph were not from Bethlehem. They were from Nazareth, but they had to travel south to Bethlehem for the census. And in order to fulfill what the scripture said, that the Messiah will be of David's family and come from Bethlehem. Well, Jesus is of the family of David, and he was born in Bethlehem. So in verse 43, so a division occurred in the crowd because of him. Some of them even wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. So the guards went to the chief priests and the Pharisees and asked them, what, why did you not bring him? The guards answered, never before has anyone spoken like this. Remember in Matthew's gospel, they talked about Jesus speaking with authority, not as the Pharisees and the scribes. Well, now there's the guards are answering, never before has anyone spoken like this. In verse 47, so the Pharisees answered them, have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd, which does not know the law, is accursed. Nicodemus, one of their members who had come out to him earlier, said to them, I want to back up just a second here. Very early on in John's gospel, Nicodemus was the one who approached Jesus at night and asked him what he must do. And Jesus said he must be born from above. This is the same Nicodemus that we heard about last week. So this is verse 50. Nicodemus, one of their members, who had come to him earlier, said to him, Does our law condemn a person before it first hears him and finds out what he is doing? They answered and said to him, You are not from Galilee also, are you? Look and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. Very interesting point there. No prophet arises from Galilee. The true prophet, the Messiah, will come from Bethlehem, and that's exactly where Jesus came from. We are now at the end of chapter 7, and we are at 37 minutes on the computer. Last week, I got cut off right about the 43 or 44 minute mark. So what we're going to do is we're going to continue on. We're going to begin with chapter 8. If this cuts off, I will just uh, have it loaded up on the website, and don't think that I ran off. It's just one of those things where I'm not technically competent. I'm relying on other people much smarter than I am. We have cleared off all of the old sessions, so there should be plenty, plenty of memory. Cross your fingers. All right, we're ready for chapter 8. A woman caught in adultery. While Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, excuse me, it's actually verse 53. And it's a very strange break here at the end of chapter 7. Then each went to his own house, well, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now, why did they split it that way? I don't know. When we get to heaven, let's ask St. John. I'm sure he has a great reason. So in verse 2 of chapter 8, early in the morning, Jesus arrived again in the temple area, and all the people started coming to him. And he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and made her stand in the middle. They said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? They said this to test him so that they could have some charge to bring against him. Now the first thing I notice about this is the woman was caught in adultery. She is guilty, caught in the act, as they say. But where's the boy, the man, who was the one that she was with? Is he a faster runner? Maybe she was a slow runner and he got away and she didn't. There's no mention at all made of him. But as we know, it takes two to commit adultery. So this woman has been abandoned by the guy that she was sitting with. Now she is all ready to be stoned. And then the Pharisees and the scribes saying, hey, we're going to test Jesus here. The law is specific, stoning for adultery. What is Jesus going to do? Very interesting question. So, chapter 8, verse 6, 
They said this to test him so that they could have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and began to write on the ground with his finger. When they continued asking him, he straightened up and said to them, let the one among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Now, somebody asked a question. 80 or 90% of the people at the time of Jesus did not know how to read and write. It was an agrarian, agricultural, farming, fishing type of community. Most people did not go to school, so they did not know how to read and write. Did Jesus know how to write? According to this, he did because he began to write on the ground with his finger. What did he write? We have no idea. Did Jesus know how to read? Yes, he did, because he went into the synagogue in Nazareth. They handed him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He read it, so he obviously knew how to read and write. This is the only evidence in the entire Bible that has anything about Jesus writing anything. We don't have any of the letters that he wrote to Mary and Joseph. We don't have anything that he wrote. And even we don't have this because he wrote it in the dirt, wrote it in the ground. So Jesus bent down and began to write on the ground with his finger. In verse 7, when they continued asking him, he straightened up and said to them, let the one among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he bent down and wrote on the ground. And in response, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. So he was left all alone with the woman before him. What did Jesus write? Many biblical scholars believe that he was writing the sins of the people who were ready to stone her. Now think about this. You're ready to stone somebody for adultery. What happens if this man, Jesus, knows your sins and is writing them on the ground? Isn't that interesting? They all went away one by one, beginning with the elders. So Jesus was left alone with the woman before him. In verse 10, then Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She replied, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, do not sin anymore. The forgiving power of Jesus. He could have just stayed there, watched her be stoned. That was the law. But Jesus lives by a higher law, the law of salvation, the law of love and mercy, compassion and forgiveness. So Jesus did not condemn her. But then he adds in this little twist. Go and from now on, do not sin anymore. The idea, that yes, you're alive, you have been saved, but do not sin anymore. In verse 12, Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisee said to them, you testify in your own behalf, so your testimony cannot be verified. But Jesus answered and said to them, even if I do testify on my own behalf, my testimony can be verified, because I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you do not know where I came from or where I'm going. You judge by appearances, but I do not judge anyone. And even if I should judge, my judgment is valid because I am not alone. But it is I and the Father who sent me. Once again, showing how he is joined to the Father. Three persons and one God. It is I and the Father who sent me. Even in your law it is written that the testimony of two men can be verified. I testify on my own behalf, and so does the Father who sent me. So they said to him, Where is your Father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the treasury in the temple area. But no one arrested him, because his hour had not yet come. All of this is falling into place. Jesus knows that it will be the third Passover, that he shares the meal, the Last Supper, the meal with his disciples, and that's when he will the next day be crucified and then rise from the dead. So Jesus continues this narrative with uh, verse 21. We're still in chapter 8, verse 21. He said to them again, I'm going away and you will look for me, but you will die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, he's not going to kill himself, is he? 
because he said, where I'm going, you found it come. He said to them, you belong to what is below. I belong to what is above. You belong to this world, but I do not belong to this world. That is why I told you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Let's back up a second here. If you do not believe that I am, I am is the word that God the Father speaks quite often in the Old Testament where people are saying, who are you? And he simply says, I am. Well, now Jesus is saying the same thing. For if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. So in verse 25, so they said to him, who are you? And Jesus said to them, what I told you from the beginning, I have much to say to you in condemnation, but the one who sent me is true. And what I heard from him, I will tell the world. They did not realize that he was speaking to them of the father. Seems to me like they would have figured it out by now with all the references to the father. But Jesus says they still did not realize that he was speaking, that they were speaking, that he was speaking to them of his father. So in verse 28, so Jesus said to them, when you lift up the son of man, then you will realize that I am and that I do nothing on my own, but I say only what the father taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone because I always do what is pleasing to him. Because he spoke this way, many came to believe in him. They're finally putting the pieces of the puzzle together. They're finally realizing who Jesus is, and they're coming to believe in him. In verse 31, Jesus then said to those Jews who believed in him, If you remain in my word, you will truly be my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Once again, all these long narratives, these speeches of Jesus, there we get these little kernels. We get these nuggets, if you will, the golden nuggets type of thing. If you remain in my word, you will truly be my disciple, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It is the truth that frees us. It is the lies that enslave us, but the truth that sets us free. In verse 33, they answered him, we are descendants of Abraham, and have never been enslaved to anyone. How can you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Amen, I say, amen, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not remain in a household forever, but a son always remains. So if a son frees you, then you will truly be free. I know that you are descendants of Abraham, but you are trying to kill me, because my word has no room among you. I tell you what I've seen in the Father's presence. Then do what you have heard from the Father. Once again, Jesus is emphasizing this relationship between him and the Father. Now in verse 39, this dialogue, this back and forth continues. And again, this is chapter 8, verse 39. They answered and said to him, Our father is Abraham. And Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works of Abraham. But now you are trying to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You are doing the works of your father. So they said to him, we are not illegitimate. We have one father, God. But Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and am here. I did not come on my own, but he sent me. Once again, Jesus is establishing this, but also it's irritating the people. They're going to get back to that charge of blasphemy, and that's the problem that they're facing. In verse 43, why you do not understand what I'm saying? Because you cannot bear to hear my word. You belong to your father, the devil, and you willingly carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he speaks in character because he is the a liar and the father of liars. This is an interesting thing. He's pointing out very clear here exactly who Satan is. He actually refers to him as the devil here. And he talks about there's no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he speaks in character 
because he is a liar and the father of lies. We know that lies, dishonesty, is one of the main aspects of evil. And that's exactly what Jesus is referring to. The truth will set us free. So in verse 45, but because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you charge me with sin? If I'm telling the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears the words of God. For this reason you do not listen, because you do not belong to God. It's their decision. Do they belong to God or to the devil? And he says right, very clearly, you do not belong to God. So in verse 48, the Jews answered and said to him, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and are possessed? Jesus answered, I am not possessed. I honor my father, but you dishonor me. I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the one who judges. And then I say to you, whoever keeps my word will never see death. Now, this is a very interesting line that a lot of people are going to pick up with. So in verse 52, so the Jews said to him, now we are sure that you are possessed. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, whoever keeps my word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died or the prophets who died? Who do you make yourself out to be? And Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is worth nothing. But it is my father who glorifies me. Of him you say, he is our God. They're admitting that they are truthful, they are faithful to the one true God. Maybe not in their actions, but at least in their beliefs. In verse 55, you do not know him, but I know him. And if I should say that I do not know him, I would be like you, a liar. But I do know him and keep his word. Abraham, your father, rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you're not yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Amen, I say to you, before Abraham came to be, I am. Those famous words, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid and went out of the temple area. Once again, there's this dialogue, there's this conflict going on between Jesus and the leaders of the Jewish people. They are not ready to accept him as the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Jesus is the one who is the Savior of the world. And eventually many of them will come to realize others will just go back to their old ways of life. Just as Jesus said to his disciples, are you going to leave me too? They said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We are now at 53 minutes right here. And I don't want to continue on because I know we're going to get cut off. And I promised everybody that we would stay within the hour. But I'm going to tell you a little something about the beginning of chapter 9 here, just as we prepare for next week. This is a story of a man born blind. And the question is placed, who committed the sin that caused him to be born blind? Was it this man or was it the sin of his parents? Well, how could he have sinned if he was born blind? So it must be the sin of his parents. At least that's what they thought at that time. Because at that time, they believed that anything that was wrong with you, any sort of blindness, illness, or deformity, was caused by your sin or the sin of your parents. That is not true. We know that now. But this is an interesting situation where Jesus gets involved with the people, and he heals the man who was born blind. But when they ask him whose sin was it, Jesus says clearly, neither he nor his parents sinned, it is so that the works of God might be made visible through him. I'm going to close with that because we're going to begin there next week talking about how this visit the signs of God, the works of God, may be made visible through him. We'll keep everybody in prayer, particularly those who are suffering from the coronavirus or any other diseases. Continue to pray for all those who have lost loved ones. So let's bow our heads and pray. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Good and gracious God, once again we come to you in the spirit of thanksgiving, thanking you for the graces and blessings you've bestowed upon us in our journey through the Bible. This is a challenging time. We are now having Mass out on the veranda, on the porch, outside, in front of the parish hall. But whether we are in the church or in the patio or whatever, we know that where two or more are gathered, 
God is present with us. Loving God, I call upon your blessings on all of us here today. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Stay healthy, and I look forward to seeing you soon.